Hey everybody, welcome to this week's q and I'm recording Thursday late afternoon, so should be good enough to get all the questions in, but if I missed anything, definitely get it in before next week, because I should be doing one next week, and then I might have to take a break for a week or two, depending on a million things. I'm going to keep trying, and I'm going to see if I could even maybe do it in a fun way, like record from an empty house or something like that, but either way, just uh, count on definitely a and a next week, and we'll see where it goes from there, but let's jump in and see what we got. First up, Clark Gibson is looking for a recommendation for a TV or monitor that's around 40 inches and compatible with the open source scan converter, as well as other retro gaming consoles like the Wii, the original Xbox, and stuff like that. Um, and uh, in terms of HDMI gaming from consoles that came with HDMI ports, at the moment they only have a PlayStation 3, but uh, and with no real plans to move beyond that. So, um, you know, you had mentioned a monitor, you'd mentioned only really needing 1080p, but I think in terms of price, you're probably going to end up with a 4K TV anyway, because I just see plenty more 4K TVs than I would. Uh, I don't even know if they make 1080p TVs anymore, and if they do, they're not as plentiful. And on top of that, I always test with my, you know, bottom of the barrel, $300, 42-inch LG panel that has very low lag, like four milliseconds in the upper left corner or something like that. I mean, it's very, very low. Now, obviously, you're not going to get a really high quality panel for 300. Uh, you're going to get some motion blur. You're not going to get dark blacks like you would out of an OLED, but that's a really good price and way cheaper than a more professional gaming monitor would be. So it's my suggestion that if you're, uh, to be honest, I would just really only look for TVs, unless you have a PC that you really want a PC monitor for a bunch of other different reasons that you want to connect to it. But if you're just connecting consoles, I would either go for the cheapest low lag TV that's compatible with the OSSC. Most modern ones would be. Uh, I've had great luck with LGs, but people do also mention other brands that they liked. I've also had good luck with TCL. Um, I haven't had good luck with Vizio, but other people have. And uh, Sony's kind of hit or miss, but those are pretty expensive. So I would look at those for the cheaper end of things. On the more expensive side, they have those 42-inch OLED TVs that are excellent. And they're, you know, four times the price, but they're still only 1200 compared to, you know, the thousands that they were just a few years ago. So my recommendation would be, unless you specifically need a PC monitor for other things, I would get a TV and I would just grab either the cheapest one and uh, in reference videos, Digital Foundry had one last year. I think they're probably going to do another one this year about cheap TVs all the way up. To, uh, you know, their, their favorite recommendations for TVs. Um, I did one a few years ago and that model's discontinued, but that same cheap LG TV, the 2021 model should be just as good, uh, if not better. So I would definitely go for those. You also had a question about custom firmware modded PlayStation 3 stuff. Uh, I am far from an expert. And on top of that, I only use my PS3 a couple times a year. So, and when I do, it's actually usually to watch movies on my BVM. So I don't, even, even though I've used custom firmware, I've installed it, you know, I have it on mine. Every time I need to do something to it, I have to re-look up what I already looked up before because I just, if, you know, if it's something you only do once a year, it's kind of hard to retain that info with all this other info flying at me every day. So I'm useless with that. And on top of that, I also have been uh, trying to check into streaming 3D Blu-ray ISOs over a network to the PlayStation 3. This was always impossible, and I think it still is. So if anybody knows anybody that's a PS3 botting expert that's also an, an AV head, maybe they could handle uh, get the answer to both of our questions. But uh, anyway, that's about all I got for you, but I would definitely go with the TVs. Aaron Seitz wants to know if there's a good solution to get Game Boy Advance games to fit the whole screen area on a 15 kilohertz CRT. They're using a PVM20L2 and have both a Mr. and a GameCube with a Game Boy Player, Game Boy Interface software. Uh, I believe the Game Boy Interface software just has those controls built right into the main version of it. I think you could do zooming uh, any way that you would like, and you could get it to fill the screen horizontally, but not vertically, because it's more of a wider aspect ratio than a standard game would be. But that, if you already have that setup, that's exactly what I would start with just to see. And I think Mr. has different scaling options as well, but I'm pretty sure it's just a few button pushes on Game Boy Interface. 
Kevin K is looking to connect their Dreamcast into an open source scan converter and was wondering what my opinion was on which cable would be better, SCART or VGA. They already have the SCART Dreamcast cable from Retro Gaming Cables, and they have a set of VGA Dreamcast cables on the way. So specifically to the OSSC, definitely SCART and definitely the one with the switch on it. And that's because the open source scan converter doesn't have a low pass filter that can pass the VGA signal through, only the SCART and the component video. Uh, also, it's only one cable that you would need rather than swap between them. The only question I would have is if you already have the SCART Dreamcast cable from Retro Gaming Cables, is it the one that's 15 kilohertz only? Or is it the one with the switch on the console side that lets you toggle between 15 and 31 kilohertz? So 480i and 480p. And that's definitely what I would recommend in that setup. You get the use of the low-pass filter in all resolutions. Uh, you get both sets of resolutions just by flicking a switch between them. So while most of the Dreamcast library is 480p anyway, if you do run into games that are 480i only or require the switch trick or 240p compatible, you might want to do that just for the heck of it anyway. So that's definitely my recommendation. Um, and all of those cables are linked right on the Dreamcast page. So I'll drop a link in the chat or in the chat in the description uh, just for reference. DW623 is about to pick up a 32-inch CRT and was wondering what they could use for a TV stand. Outside of getting lucky and finding an old CRT TV stand at a thrift store, what solutions do I know of? Uh, so I have two that I've been using for years that I love. The first are just simply AV carts that would, you would normally find years ago for people putting CRTs on them, but you could still get them now. The price has gone up a lot this year, I think because of material shortage and things like steel have gone up in price, but I was able to get a Luxor one for like 65 that I think it sells for like 150 now. But the only thing with those are they're a tiny bit too high for my liking. So if you have a gaming chair or if you have a couch or a, you know, a recliner that's naturally higher up, they're fine. For me, they're just a hair too high with a 32 inch TV. They're just about okay with a 20 inch and a 14 inch tends to sit just perfectly. Um, but that's just preference. If you don't mind looking up a little bit, that should be fine for you. And the other thing too is any wire racks on wheels I love as well. I mean, you don't have to put them on wheels but I personally love them because you could buy them. Even the knockoff ones are decent, but um, as long as you make sure to take a look at the wheels and the casters and everything else to go with it, because the one thing I did have happen to me is I bought one of the knockoff ones with wheels that screw into the bottom, and I had my BVM D32 on it, and just by always wheeling it around, because of the weight of the BVM, they, the uh, wheels themselves backed out little by little to the point where when I finally was able to get a really good, not knockoff restaurant quality one that's rated at, you know, a lot of pounds per shelf, like hundreds and hundreds of pounds, um, I put it together and I was actually calling my friend Beast to come over to help me move the BVM. And I'm looking at it going, huh, did I put the wheels on wrong or did I, did I align everything right? Because it looks a little lopsided. And as I got closer, I realized... The new one wasn't lopsided. The old one was because one of the front wheels was about to fall off. So if I had just moved that wire rack a couple more times, my BVM probably would have slid off and landed on its screen. So it's funny. I got like uh, angry mom strength and just grabbed it and picked it up and moved it over myself. <laughs> it was way too heavy for me to normally pick up like that. And more uh, wide, I think the width of it is probably the bigger issue. But as soon as I saw that, I went, no, and I just <laughs> grabbed it, moved it over. Uh, so you can use knockoffs, but you're definitely going to want to always look at the wheels. Um, um, a standard 32-inch consumer-grade TV doesn't weigh half as much as that BVM, so you might be okay. Um, and the only other thing to remember is if the back of the TV sticks off a little bit, it's not really a big deal. Because, you know, if you could picture a consumer-grade CRT from the side, you know, it's got the glass on one side, and then it tapers back to where the tube comes, and that back part has no weight to it. It's, you know, the, the, uh, the back usually hangs over where the ports are. So that's something else that I would consider as well. It's just getting a wheel rack that's definitely wide enough to put all of the plastic on, you know, where, where the bottom of the TV is. But if the part that hangs just in midair gets over, that's fine. But the wheel rack part, 
you know, it, you don't have to have wheels, uh, which I guess would be safer. But because these things are so heavy, anytime you wanted to clean behind it or or add a new component or test something out by screwing it into the RF jack, having it on wheels means it's super, super easy. So those are definitely my recommendations. I'll put a link to uh, a page just a silly page on the website I wrote years ago about the different rack solutions that I use and all that stuff that should have links to everything. If the links are expired because parts went out of stock, you could at least get a general sense of what I was using and try to just Google stuff with the same terms on it. Sam Connolly said, rather than wait for Analog's proprietary DAC to become available again, they're planning to downscale their Super NT through the Tink 5X and a couple of Amazon DACs, as I suggested in the video. They're wondering if this will be an acceptably lag-free solution for playing the Super NT on a CRT through component, or whether they should be patient and wait for analog. My personal opinion is if you set that Super NT to 480p and do the downscaling, it's probably gonna be a flawless or near flawless solution. Um, if the DAC ever comes back in stock and shipping isn't a million dollars to wherever wherever you live, then you know consider it. But that's a perfectly good solution. Um, and the good news is, if you want to buy one of those cheap DACs that I always talk about, which I guess I'll leave a link to that too, um, you could always use those for a million other things. Uh, in fact, you could even use them right now for a million other things by uh, putting an HDMI switch between them, and you could have modern consoles set to 480p to go through it to be downscaled through the Tink 5X. So either way, I would confidently say just buy one of those and see how you like it, because even if you decide to upgrade in the future, it's still something that you could use for multiple different things. Um, Sam also mentioned they do have a Super Nintendo with HD retrovision cables, but it's not a one chip, and they'd like to get the sharpest image possible on their consumer set. So yeah, I, I agree with you. Using the Super NT right there is perfect for that, and you always have the nostalgia of the original SNES, should you ever want to use that. So it's really the best of both worlds. But I would say, I would confidently say just drop the 20 bucks on a DAC knowing that even if you don't use it forever for this, I'm sure you're going to use it for other stuff. Hector Santana wanted me to follow up about the question regarding modding CRTs and wanted to know if I could list the other methods I knew to mod TVs without the jungle chip mod. Um, so now you're getting into real expert territory. So I'm not trying to say that you're not an expert or that you shouldn't do it. I just want everybody listening to know that doing other stuff like like I'm about to mention is starting to get way more complicated than just basic electronics and tapping into a jungle chip. But you could look into a replacement chassis that just plugs into that model tube that automatically has component or RGB inputs. Um, you, know, you could possibly get an arcade chassis for something like that, but then you'd have to make sure all the levels are exactly the, the correct voltage on your own with a scope and a test pattern and all of that stuff. Um, there are some people that have tested modding directly to the electron gun, which would work if you were using it for something like one console or one arcade board, but might cause some issues if you're switching between multiple because you'd have to realign everything and there's no OSD at that point. So there's, there's totally potential for this, but not any ones that I would recommend your average person to do. It would really be expert only, and each one could have some serious disadvantages. Um, lastly, would I agree that there are absolutely some consumer TVs from the 90s and on that will never have the potential to be RGB modded? I would never say never, but um, I would say never with an easy method that I could just tell you about in a QA. and a um, There's many different things you could do. Just like, it's exactly like saying, could you never put a, an old Dodge engine into a, a Chevy? Like, I mean, no, you can't just pick an engine out of like a 69 Dodge and put it into 69 Chevy, but you could buy motor mount converters. You could, you know, you could rebuild the whole thing from the ground up and re-weld new brackets onto the chassis. I mean, there's a million things you could do, but the direct question is it won't just plug in like that. So uh, I think that's a decent metaphor. Hopefully I didn't make it worse, but yeah, I really wouldn't, I wouldn't count on any of the other methods or, or like miracle methods for some that can't be modded. Um, and once again, unless it's like a super expert thing, which is definitely possible, but not something I would really recommend people mess around with. JQ said they're looking to set up an Extron Crosspoint for their consumer TV. They have an RGB to comp and a shiny bow switch. And they were wondering if either of those devices take TTL sync from the Extron safely. They're planning on using a BNC to SCART cable from Retro Access. Uh, I would definitely say just to be on the cautious side, 
from the output of the cross point to the input of the RGB to comp, I would make sure that there is a 470 ohm resistor on the sync line. And I'm confident giving that advice because if you don't need it, you'll probably turn on your TV and you'll have sync issues, which is fine. Turn your TV off, you know, and figure it out from there. Whereas the opposite, if you do need it and don't put it in, it'll look like it's working, but it could be killing any of the equipment in the chain. So I would just be cautious on that side. Um, Cause I mean, it's just, why not, right? A resistor costs less than a dollar and you could, most people with a soldering gun could solder it in. Even if it's only, you know, even if you're a beginner and it takes you three or four tries to get it right, that's fine. It's worth the effort just in case. Um, if you have to open up the cable and maybe put a resistor on the sync line, what pin exactly would it be on the SCART end? You're going to want to just double check the pin out, but SCART 20, uh, pin 20, the pointy end. Let me see if I have a SCART cable here. Yeah, all right. So uh, the po top pointy end is usually the one that's sync. Now, th this could be different depending on if it's an input or output device. Um, there could be a, a, a PCB in there that, you know, it might look different, but it's basically that one, but double check it with a multimeter and, you know, double check the print pinouts. I was about to say print out the pinouts just to be sure. Um, but I mean, it should be easy enough. You should be able to spot it right away. So I would definitely say add the resistor just for the heck of it. But, um, you know, it, it's not going to harm anything to do it. So you might as well just do it. Daniel Adato said they have an otaku switch with an all component video setup, and they'd like to connect it to the RetroTINK 5X via HD RetroVision cables, but they can't seem to find them in stock anywhere. Uh, is there any other cables I would recommend. They checked the Amazon store and didn't see anything. So that's a, a tough question. Um, there are definitely other good cables out there. The problem is consistency and, uh, and price, really. So you could go to Monoprice and buy cables and hope that they're shielded and you'll probably have good luck, but you might spend more than you would have spent on the HD Retrovisions. And it would be really terrible if you ended up buying something that said shielded, gold-plated, whatever, and it turned out to not be like so many of the cables I've bought in the past. I cannot tell you how many VGA cables that have ended up in the garbage because they were beyond terrible. They weren't shielded at all, even though they were thick, it was all foam. Like it barely worked, it created all this interference. Like, you know, I hate wasting stuff, but the only place for those were the trash can, even though they were supposed to be decent ones. So generally speaking, when stuff like this happens, a parts out of stock like this, I would recommend going to Amazon and finding the cheapest ones that say shielded. And just know that they're probably not gonna be, but it's not gonna hurt anything. It's not like it's a voltage issue. And just just pick those up until the HD retrovisions come in stock. And the reason that I would explain it that way rather than saying, oh, well, maybe just buy the more expensive ones or, you know, go to this store and, and whatever else is that the way I look at a lot of this stuff is these are tools in your toolbox. So you don't use every screwdriver and every hammer every time you open your toolbox, but you're happy that they're there. And for something like this, cables that are meh quality, if you leave those in a drawer somewhere, I guarantee at some point you're going to go, oh, darn, I need another component video cable to test something. And there it's going to be. So I think my opinion, which could be wrong, but my personal opinion is I would rather tell somebody spend eight bucks on something just to hold you off until the good thing is in stock, then throw that in a drawer somewhere and use it whenever you need something like that. I think I would be more confident saying that than here's some component cables I bought in the past that were fine two years ago when I bought them. Good luck and see if they're still fine today. I, I'm, I'm not confident to say that. And I'm sure there are other good cables out there. I'm not saying HD retrovisions are the only, you know, RCA to RCA component cable that ever existed. I'm just saying they're consistently awesome every time you buy them, which is why I push them. So, um, and the only other thing too, check with Castlemania games or even just tweet at HD Retrovision and ask when they're going to be in stock because I thought they were coming back in stock soon. So, um, maybe this is a, maybe this conversation's pointless and they're about to be back in stock tomorrow. I don't know. I would check with them, but good question. Earth to Brux was trying to get 480p from their Wii to their HD TV to play GameCube games, and they picked up a component to HDMI converter from the Amazon page that I linked to, and it works great for widescreen capable Wii games, but stretches everything to widescreen even when they set the Wii to 4x3. Their TV somehow doesn't have any setting to force 4x3, so they're seemingly out of luck with this converter. So 
that might not actually be the fault of the converter. There could be a bunch of things involved and you could buy 10 converters that all work the same. It could be the converter, but I really doubt that. Uh, I think it's more with your TV and I would absolutely download the manual for that TV and double and triple check. And if it's a newer TV, see if there's a firmware update or something like that, because every TV and every monitor that I've ever owned has one of those settings. And in fact, the monitors I had that I thought didn't have a setting had it buried like five menu things deep. And in fact, in the RetroTink 5X video, I showed Dreamcast stretched for this exact reason. I left a little note saying my monitor doesn't have an aspect ratio control. And a few weeks later, I found out that I had to turn off game mode, turn off free sync, then set the aspect ratio, then turn game mode back. It was something crazy like that. So I would definitely say go through the manual of your TV with a fine toothed comb, see if there's a firmware update or something like that. And I would attack the problem that way first. And then I'd kind of look into a solution for maybe uh, adjusting aspect ratio. Obviously the RetroTINK uh, 5X would be the perfect thing for this because you could scale that uh, the Wii games any way you'd like. You could set the widescreen or or um, four by three aspect ratio right in it, or the OSSC would do that as well, either one. So I guess that would kind of be, I guess that's kind of the best recommendation is first mess with your TV and then just approach it as if the problem isn't going to be fixed by buying another cheap uh, analog to digital converter and get something like an OSSC, which you could find used on eBay real cheap, uh, brand new. They're pretty reasonably priced. Or, of course, the RetroTINK 5X, which is definitely the, the beginning of the next generation of all of this cool stuff. So uh, that's kind of the best advice I would have for now. Um, you did ask about the Wii to HDMI dongles. Um, the problem with that is they're not consistent. I believe I talked about this in a, uh, a recent Q&A, but that's the issue with those is you could buy 10 and they, you know, nine might work perfect. And one has a bunch of really bad uh, interference on the screen, color issues, something else. So you could try one, but I don't know that that would even fix the problem. I think the problem is more on your TV's end of things. So start with the manual and go from there. Old School Gamers has a question about lag, and respectfully, I'm not going to read the question out loud because it sounds like you may have gotten some misinformation, and I don't want to read it and confuse things. I just want to skip right to the answer, and I guess it's best to start with a more broad answer of no signal format has any more or less lag than the other. And I guess a great example for this is if you take something like a Sony PVM RGB monitor, whether it's composite video, S video, RGB, or component video, from the time that signal enters the ports and back to the time that it starts drawing on the CRT in the upper left-hand corner is less than one millisecond. None of those formats add more or less lag than the other. And on top of that, as I showed in the lag testing retro, yeah, lag testing retro scalers video, if you take an HDMI signal, put it through a digital to analog converter and into a CRT, it's the same thing. Less than one millisecond from the time the signal is sent to the time the CRT starts drawing it. Not one of those signal formats would ever add more lag than the other. Same with VGA, SCART, you know, um, DisplayPort, DVI, anything else that you could throw out. The, the connector or the signal doesn't add any lag. It's what's at the target end processing it. And I think one of the things that might have gotten confusing for people is that I've found in the past few years that anytime I was able to lag test a TV, if I tested it through its component video ports or, or composite video ports or whatever else, any of the analog inputs, it seemed to have more lag on every set that I tested than going directly through the HDMI ports. This doesn't mean that every single flat panel is like that, but it means a lot of them are like that, even in game mode. So that's possibly where some of the misconceptions came from. Anybody with a time sleuth could test this themselves. Um, you, all you need is a cheap DAC, the HDMI to component video converter, and you could even verify that the DAC is zero lag by plugging that into a CRT. So anybody at home could take this measurement and see zero. Just know that you got to uh, align the time sleuth sensor with the exact corner. Otherwise, it'll show latency because you're not actually at the top. You might need to pop the bezel off or something, but you could test that yourself and then take that 
same tester and use it on your TV, on your flat panel TV, and then go direct HDMI in. And as long as you're set in game mode and all the settings are the same, you still should be able to see more lag on most sets. So I don't know why that is. It doesn't make any sense to me because as we've proved a million times in a row in all these different videos, you don't have to add lag converting from analog to digital at all. Um, with HD CRTs, it's the same problem that I, I, it's hit or miss, but you'd have to measure each of those individually. And those were made at a time where, uh, it, you know, the whole industry was going through a transition. So each TV could be completely different. Like um, They're definitely not all the same because I've tested a whole bunch of them. So that would be the only other caveat is HD CRTs would might ad lag they might not you're gonna have to test them all but non hd just all analog crts uh zero lag every input now the other side of things the upscaling side that's another issue that you could see in external boxes and that's why i put out that video lag test lag testing retro scalers because when you take scalers that are meant for tv signals and you plug in and you know a composite video cable and this scaler is designed to take a VHS tape or a DVD and scale it to HD, it adds a bunch of lag because it was never designed to be used with games. So it takes a few extra seconds to, to process the image or, you know, milliseconds, not seconds, but, you know, you probably get five frames, you know, almost a full second of lag on some of these, even higher than that. But that's why some scalers add lags because they were never designed to be used with games. They, they have plenty of time to, to edit the signal out, to digitize it, and to do some processing to clean it up. And that's why it's so important to use scalers that are designed for retro gamers and not for anything else. So hopefully that's a decent explanation. I'll drop a link to the video in there, but I think that should sum everything up. A couple of questions from Jason Guffey. First, they have a DB Electronics RCA audio adapter for the Extron Crosspoints, and they bought a bunch that's labeled input but they've been using it for output. They want to know if they're breaking something by doing this or otherwise damaging their equipment. I think that you should be completely fine in doing that. The last time I checked the cross points, uh, which is the same pinout as a lot of the other Extron equipment, I believe they had one setting they recommended for mono uh, to make sure you don't get any interference at all just by combining the two circuits together. And I think they had another recommended way of setting it up for stereo input. And I don't know about the cross point ones, but it could be that they have inputs and outputs, but they're actually the same thing. They're, you know, it could just be that it's the equivalent of a Y cable inside and you wouldn't really need to worry about that. So my gut is telling me that you should be completely fine. As long as it's working, there's no crackles or interference or anything like that. My gut says you should be fine, but you should just for the heck of it, look up a manual for the cross points and just read into it and see. But I think you'd be fine on that. Uh, second, I'm going to, I'll read the question out loud because uh, this one's tricky and I don't even know if I'm going to have a good answer, but, uh, in, they see a lot of terms get thrown around regarding color, meaning color range or color space, such as YUV versus RGB, 444, 422, Rec 609 versus 701. And while they think they understand what that means, they don't quite get how what we perceive as red is different between YUV and RGB. Isn't the color the same wavelength of light regardless of how exactly we perceive it? Uh, so I'm not an expert even close in color space terms, but I think the issue is that if you're talking about things like component video versus RGB, so the component video white color space versus RGB color space, our eyes should never see the difference between those at all. Uh, it should be done in a way that we could never perceive it, which is why things like the HD retrovision cables are so important because they do the conversions correctly and your eyes should not perceive any difference. However, things like color compression, you should be able to see. Now, when I say should be able to see, this is going to differ for each type, uh, each different person's eyes, I guess is the best way to say it. I have friends that can spot color issues just by glancing at a screen, whereas I can't, but I can sh spot sharpness issues. Like I could just probably look at a, a screenshot and tell you what version of the Super Nintendo you're using, whereas, you know, other people could tell you exactly how you're processing the color in your chain. So it's, it's kind of something that, you know, you could, or, or you may or may not be sensitive to it. And a lot of 
it also has to do with what you're looking at. So if you're looking at a movie, like a brand new 4K movie, um, it's probably going to have color compression in it, and you're probably never going to notice. Same thing with modern video games, whereas if you had a classic video game, because there's lots of large spots of color, even with even with small characters on screen, it's still relatively larger than uh, the spot of color that you would see on a modern high-resolution game console. Um, I think that's where you would start to see these color compression differences more. But that's about as far as I'd be comfortable giving with an answer because I don't want to try to talk technically about it and then just completely shove my foot in my mouth. I just know that uh, it's still something that um, that I have a hard time demonstrating sometimes in my videos, but I'm getting better at it, but I'm not the person to explain it yet. I'm still learning, still also learning the better way to explain and demonstrate these things. So, you know, hopefully I'll get through that uh, and figure something out. Also, uh, Steve from RetroTech had some cool stickers of his logos and such. When could we expect RetroRGBStore.com branded merch? Uh, that's a decent idea. I have stickers in the store now and t-shirts. Um, any merch like that uh, after the move's over and I'm settled, I, I would love to look into doing stuff like that because there are so many cool things like like the neat stickers and everything that I just wouldn't have even thought to make. And I saw like Greg from Laser Bear drops very cool stickers in all of his boxes and they're often different. So if you buy multiple times from them, you'll get different stickers. It's, it's very cool. So I agree. Stuff like that is, is a neat bonus, but uh, it's something I got to circle back around to after I'm all settled and caught up because I'm sure it's going to be at least a month catching up with everything I'm missing in the two-ish weeks that I'm uh, going to be doing the move, so we'll see. Well, that's it for this week. Once again, next week's Q&A might be my last one for a few weeks, so if you had any questions or anything that you wanted me to elaborate on, definitely ask in wherever it is that you support in the comment section of this week's episode, uh, and I will get to all of them next week, and then we'll see how things go over the course of the next few weeks. But if I don't get a chance to do them, just Keep adding questions if you want to the, you know, this week's Q&A and however many they are, I'll just get to them as soon as everything's back in the swing of things. So thank you all so much for your support. Uh, without your support, none of the things I'm a part of would be possible. So thank you all so much and I'll see you next week.